Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the podcast that Brian De Palma doesn't want you to hear, but oh. Barbara Cook would really like <laughs> you to hear. It's monkeys and playbills, y'all. That's Paul DeGers. That's Jillian Willems. And, oh my gosh, who is this other very familiar voice to most of you, I would guess? Hi, everybody. <gasps> who is that? <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold the phones. Everyone slow down. That's producer Daphne Finlayson. Hi. But Daphne, usually you're just manning the board, making sure the levels are okay, making sure the mics are recording. Yeah, this episode's going to sound like shit. <laughs> <laughs> There's just no one to edit it anymore because you are this week's special guest. I sure am. Yes, absolutely. Oh, geez, if I want a, spe- if I want a sound effect, who do I ask? You can still ask me. I'll just be like, I'll like make a note to myself. <laughs> Very good. At some point, I might say, okay, Daphne, this is where you're going to add the following. Also, I love you. You're doing great. Yeah. Okay. Um, That's nice. So yeah. <laughs> d- future Daphne, if you could add a, um, like a wild, raucous applause Ooh, for when we yeah. said your name, that Very would be good. great. Okay, cool. Her? As our library of episodes grows, so does our library of sound effects. Well, this is what I'm hoping. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to be that guy from like Parks and Rec that just has an entire soundboard full of nonsense sound cues. <laughs> I love that. For those of you joining us for the first time, we are Monkeys and Playbills. We're a podcast based in Winnipeg, Manitoba, where we talk about Broadway musicals that had runs of 100 performances or fewer, not counting previews. And what the heck happened? And today we're talking about one of the most famous... Broadway flops of all time in celebration of Spooktober, the spookiest month of uh, of the whole year. We're here to talk about Carrie the Musical, a flop so famous that a book about Broadway flops was named after it. Yeah. Yep. Not since Carrie, 40, 40 years of Broadway flops. Absolutely. Oh, can't wait to read that. A flop so famous that it didn't break the double digits on Broadway. Oof. A flop so famous that even despite all of that, it's probably one of the more beloved musicals, mm-hmm. at least cult for classic. The, even, I would I say, say one of the biggest cult classic musicals. Mm-hmm. Um, in my experience with Carrie, when someone takes out a song from Carrie, it's like, oh, this is going to be good. What a weird good choice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Daphne. Yes. Why are you here? We we carpooled. <laughs> <laughs> Be- why? <laughs> Producer Daphne, you're here for every episode. Yes. Why is this the episode Mm -hmm. where you are an actual guest rather than just manning the board? Okay, so important thing to know about me is that uh, I am a big Stephen King fan. Yes. Uh, I come by this honestly at my parents' house. There is, I think, an entire bookcase just full of Stephen King. Oh, that's amazing. So my mom owns basically everything he's ever written from his... Books published under his own name to uh, the Richard Bachman novels, like good. basically yep. everything. So she started reading me Stephen King books when I was about 12. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, starting with the more, not G rated, because there's still regicide and <laughs> yeah. a, like a girl hallucinating that her favorite baseball player is talking to her. But Ooh. like right. she read me um, The Eyes of the Dragon and The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon. Okay. When I was 12, uh, I have very distinct memories of. A camp counselor walking up to me while I was reading a Stephen King book and going, what are you reading, sweetie? And I just hold up Uh. Cujo and I think (laughs) I saw her like make the sign of the cross and walk away. Right. Uh. Cujo's the one about a grumpy dog, right? That is correct. like rabid dog. Yeah, Yeah, he's not having a good time. He's he's, he's unhappy. (laughs) So I've been reading Stephen King since I was about 12. I like, I've read... I've read most of his like more well known stuff, like yep. It and the and The Shining, and Misery, Grumpy, Ghost, mm-hmm. Grumpy Jack Nicholson, yes. Grumpy oh, Kathy yeah. Bates. Everyone's grumpy. Everybody's so much grumpy. Everyone's grumpy in these novels. <laughs> but Carrie is definitely my favorite book that he's ever written. Right. Ooh. Yeah. And oh. so, when did you read Carrie? I think I read Carrie for the first time when I was in ninth grade. Okay. Which was what are you fifteen then? 15 like fourteen, or nine. right about that. Yeah, fourteen or fifteen, I think. Yeah, which is a pretty good time to read Carrie. Yes, like when you're fresh in high school. Yeah. For me, I was like not super popular in high right. school, so I could like relate to her on that level. Mm-hmm. But yeah. it was like it was definitely a good time to read Carrie. Very <laughs> it was when I was in high school. And Paul, what's your experience? Maybe specifically, maybe with Stephen King, and then with Carrie specifically. Sure, my experience with Stephen King is very little. When I was also in high school and. uh you know, trying out a bunch of different books to see um, what I really like to read. I read some uh, some Richard Bachman books, his uh, his pseudonym, and I mm-hmm. thought they were okay. I'm also, as fans of this podcast, have probably come to figure out at this point, 
like movies a little bit. I enjoy watching oh, movies you do. from time to time. Interesting. I'm oh. still always learning new things. About <laughs> <laughs> so very familiar with um, the 1970s Brian De Palma movie mm-hmm. that's uh, extremely popular and extremely iconic. Yeah. That I like quite a bit as a movie in its own right. That was the first actual bit of Carrie that I experienced. Ah, so I okay. really enjoyed it. When I was 13 or 14, watched the 2003 made for TV movie. Oddly enough, I'm not sure why that ended up being the one that I watched, but I enjoyed it. It like just come out on VHS. I okay. Think. I love The Shining. Yes. Um, once again, the movie, not the um, not the book. Yeah. I haven't read the book. In general, I really like Stephen King adaptations mm-hmm. of movies, and that's my relationship mostly is the iconic movies that have been made out of his novels. Right. What about you? That's the same for me. Totally. So I remember my mom is... Hi, Jennifer. My mom hi, Jennifer. is a wonderful person yep, who I absolutely. think... Whether she'll admit this or not, has an affinity for blood and gore, likes kind of scary movies. That's a little bit on brand. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And so when I was younger, she actually introduced me to that genre. And part of that for her was introducing me to the movie Carrie. And I was probably 13 or 14 when I watched it. And I remember just being shocked and scared and surprised and excited and then i just couldn't stop watching horror after that because it was sort of like it's a great horror it is absolutely because it tricks you a little Mm -hmm. into feeling safe and cool and comfortable and then it's not at all the 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 quote-unquote monster in this case which is who is carrie white is so sympathetic yeah it's such a good introduction to horror that makes you feel and makes you sympathize with having the monster be the protagonist yes is so good and yeah. it's also like not really a horror movie the first like hour and 20 totally. minutes yeah mm-hmm. and then the last 20 minutes it's a horror movie yeah. yeah in the way that we think of horror yeah 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 and then i don't have much experience in reading Stephen King novels, but yeah. I remember reading this series of books called Uncle John's Bathroom Reader. I'm not yeah! really familiar with those. I've got one of those so, in my youngster's bathroom, totally. So my <laughs> uncle has a cabin, and at the cabin, they had a, a wide array of books, and Classic. one of them was, perfect, of course... Perfect pooping book. They're made, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And in, yeah. in that That's what they're made book, for. <laughs> they're called the bathroom like, reader. I know, but it's just a funny thing to call. So I would take them out of the bathroom sure, and down to the dock and I would read and in Perfect. one of these books there was a section about Stephen King and I read it and uh, there's this story and I'm sure you're both familiar with this and some of our listeners will be as well but there's this story in the bathroom reader about how Stephen King was working away furiously on this novel typing 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 and then threw it in the garbage yep. and his yeah. wife went down pulled it out of the garbage, started reading and said, you absolutely have to finish writing this. Mm -hmm. Right. And he's like, it's not working. I can't do it. And she said, no, 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 no. Trust me. Finish this book. And he did. And it was Carrie. And so that... Which is his first novel. Yeah. Yeah. His first published novel. His first published novel. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. He's written four before this, but this was the first one that actually like, you know, got any Mm -hmm. traction. So as as far as culture goes, this was the world's introduction to Stephen King. Yeah. 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 And so I remember being so intrigued by that story and then for some reason not reading any Stephen King until totally. I was like 25. But yeah, love love his work and I'm excited to dive into this musical. So it's very interesting as far as pop culture goes. This is maybe the most the, of the of the shows that we've covered, possibly the most famous piece of pop culture to be turned into a musical because at this point in the late 1980s Stephen King, Carrie was a huge success when it came out, followed Mm by hit after hit after hit as far as novels go. Mm -hmm. Um, So he's in the late 80s at the height of his power and fame? I would say so. I mean, it's the 80s. Like, look how much of his work (laughs) is now is set in the 80s. Exactly. We just don't know how to do it, not as a period piece. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So between between that and the fact that the Brian De Palma movies come out and his super has, like, become iconography... So There's time, I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah. but the timeline of this, so it yes. was originally published in the 70s. 1974, it was published. Yes. Uh, it was made, it was like the rights to it as a movie were bought almost immediately. I was going to say sense. that. Because the yeah. movie was made in 1976. Yes. Aha, 76. Okay. And then this musical goes into development in 1981 and then doesn't premiere until 1988. So I think first things first, before we actually try to summarize the plot of this musical, there's a bit more of a preamble required for this. Mm-hmm. Very good. Like many older musicals we've covered, the documentation is not as straightforward as it is for musicals, say, post-2000s. Mm-hmm. Or even even mid-90s when we covered um, uh, Sideshow, yes. which was mid-90s. Or Parade, which is late 90s. Mm-hmm. The um, It was still relatively easy to find solid documentation of what this show looked like, sounded like. 
carry in the 80s, it's much harder to find that documentation. But, because it is one of the most famous Broadway flops of all time, there is a very easy trail of breadcrumbs to cover, to follow, as to what happened. So before we start, we need to give a bit of a preamble on what that trail of breadcrumbs is that we've followed. Mm -hmm. So, Carrie the Musical is pitched, a team is gets together, and it is initially produced by the Royal Shakespeare Company. A theatre company in England that operates out of Stratford-upon-Avon, which is different from Stratford, Ontario. <laughs> Important context, uh, before we were going to do this episode, we were all talking about, do we know anybody who was in the Stratford production? I just had it, I had it in my head that Carrie, w that Carrie was originally workshopped at Stratford. Yeah, and hey, of course, being Canadian, do. I thought Stratford, Ontario, the big theater company. Yep, and that would have been embarrassing. That would have been great. So glad we caught that. Yeah. <laughs> so prior to the RSC taking it over, yeah. there was a workshop. Is that correct? I, that's my understanding. Yep. There was a workshop of the first act of the musical. Ah, that's right. Um, okay. Which is, spoiler alert, definitely the stronger act of the two mm -hmm. um, in this production. Then they brought it to, um, to RSC, to Stratford-upon-Avon, for essentially a preview and development period, where they were going to develop the show and then transfer it to New York. Mm -hmm. It ended up being a very eventful development period, where every night they were rewriting the show while they were in, um, in Stratford-upon-Avon. And then finally transferred it to Broadway. Yes. Even though the Stratford-upon-Avon run was a very intense experience. Transferred it to Broadway, where it ran for how many performances? Five. Five public performances. So I feel like there exists the same amount of versions of this musical as there were performances. That's Absolutely. my what my gut tells yeah. me. Because the story doesn't end there. The Broadway show closes. Carrie becomes a legend that's not very well documented. They never made an original cast recording. Mm. The only um, video bootlegs that exist, full video bootlegs that exist, are a recording of the first public performance at Stratford-upon-Avon, which is... One of part of our frame of reference for what we're going to be talking about today. Mm -hmm. But then in the early to mid 2000s, they start talking about, um, people start talking about revamping it to make it work. There's a lot of good material here. Yes. And so through a few more workshops in 2013, an off Broadway version, a very revamped off Broadway version opens and is much more successful. Wow. Um, ends up, they end up making a cast recording of it. They make a lot of significant changes to the style of music, mm -hmm. um, even though they keep a lot of the same content, to the way the show is structured, mm -hmm. and to the tone of the show. So, with that said, we're going into this investigation today not just assessing this Broadway production, but examining the really interesting case study of a show that has ostensibly already been solved in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, at least it's been turned from a total bomb to a pretty beloved off-Broadway show. Yes. Whether it's all um, successful changes or not, we can discuss from the point of view of the story itself. Mm -hmm. But it's a musical that has had a different arc than a musical we've covered thus far. Should we get into it? Hell yeah! Carrie the Musical. Bloody, bloody Carrie the Musical. Small cup of pig's blood, Carrie the Musical. <laughs> The whole story leading up to two minutes of horror at the end. Yeah. Horror in quotation marks. Previews began at the Virginia Theater, April 28th, 1988. It opened on May 12th, 1988, and closed on May 15th, 1988, after 16 previews and five performances. Oh. This synopsis game is going to be fun. Yep. Yeah. It's going to be fun because my challenge for the two of you, being mm -hmm. the two in the room who have also read the book. Yep. Yep. The challenge is separating that from yeah. what we saw of the 1988 Stratford run. Good luck Absolutely. and Godspeed. I've got a really interesting thing that I love about Carrie. I've got a take on this, but I'm going to save that for later, but it's going to, it plays into what we're about to do. Ooh. Daphne, you ready to try this together? Hell yeah. Okay. Hey. <laughs> Where do we start? On a blank stage, Paul. Woo! Hey! We start on a blank stage, but don't worry. It fills up quick. Very like on the quick. blankest stage I think we've ever discovered so far. Actually, this stage yeah. is always so blank. Like they got a chair later and I was so proud of them. Yeah. And there's a lot of pyro. <laughs> the stage fills up quickly though with 
teenage girls doing aerobics. Just the most 80s song you've ever heard about how important it is to fit in. To fit in, to stay thin. Um, and they're just moving and moving. <laughs> they never stop moving. Um, these poor girls, they're probably in the best shape of their life, but mm -hmm. there is no athlete who can sing well while they are doing the amount of heart-raising calisthenics that they yeah. are doing. Nope. Um, so it doesn't sound very good. Um, so we go from this gym class to our protagonist, Carrie White. Yep. Who's really upset because she's gotten her first period? Mm -hmm. No, okay. So we Kay. go from the gym class to the showers. Yes. Right, yeah. And in the showers, uh, we suddenly hear this like god awful unearthly screaming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it turns they're out all, they're all showering in their underwear for some reason. Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't understand that. Yeah. But I mean, okay, it's a Broadway show. We can't have We can't have everyone naked on stage. I understand. You know, we all like butts. Yeah. We, we all like butts. Have butts. I'm yeah. not mad, I'm just disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> But okay, so Carrie starts screaming yeah. and uh, the girls start kind of taunting her and being like, okay, what, what is going on? Why are you on? screaming? Mm -hmm. You're being a spaz. It's, yeah. it's just your period. And the gym teacher comes in. Right. And is like, basically says the same thing. Like, it's just your period. Like, what? why are you freaking out? And it becomes clear, Carrie has no idea what a period is. Mm -hmm. yeah. She thinks she's dying. Yes. yes. Which like... Granted, if I, like, the first time I got my period, spoiler, yeah. like, TMI alert, but I also was like, am I dying? Oh, wait, no, I trained for this. Right. right. Totally. You, you have this information. It. Yeah, like, yeah. oh, right, my mom gave me a book of, like, yeah. things that are going to happen to your body. Yeah. Have fun. The brief moment of panic followed by, oh, we actually have a plan. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I know what this is now. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. But Carrie has no frame of reference for right. what the hell is happening with her body right yeah. now. Totally. So... She's really upset. The, um, what's the gym teacher's name again? Uh, in this, it's Miss Gardner. Right, yes. but that's different from the book, right? This t character has had three different names yes. from the book to the movie to the right. stage. Okay. It's, it's, it's bizarre. So Miss yeah. Ms. Gardner, like, kind of tells her what's happening and, um... Well, slaps her and then tells her what's happening. Correct. Right. But we can talk about that also. We later. sure can. So we. <laughs> Other important context. When Miss Gardner slaps Carrie, a light goes out in the background. And you're like, well, that's weird. What's going on with this school? Can't they get any funding? Yeah. Yeah. That's probably not magical powers. It's that spotty 70s electrical, electrical work. Tube. No, no, knob and wire. <laughs> yeah. Knob yeah. and tube. Knob and tube. Yeah. <laughs> and also, while Carrie has been freaking out, not only have the girls been really mean to her, they're also, they also start taking pads and tampons out of the wall and yeah. throwing them at her while shouting, shouting, plug it up. Right. So then we're out of the locker room. Then we're out of the locker room. <laughs> yes. So they've all been very mean. <laughs> yes. And we oh, meet yeah. one of the girls who was doing this. Her name's Sue. And she's like kind of feeling weird about what they just did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's not a huge fan of it. Yeah. And her boyfriend, uh, Chris? Uh, her be her best friend, Chris. Her best friend, yeah. Chris. Her best friend, Chris, who is, who is a lady. Who is uh, a lady. Yeah. yeah. Is like... Why are you being so weird, Sue? It's just Carrie. Uh, like, you know what my friend calls her? Scary White. Oh. Totally. So Carrie <laughs> hears this and she sings an absolute bop um, about how her name is actually Carrie. Yeah. And it's a uh, awesome song. Even and though we it. are, we already knew. Yes. You don't have to absolutely. sing that to us. No, yeah. Carrie, we know. Yeah. It's all good. But <laughs> she says it anyways. Your name's on the masthead. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> There we go. We've um we've met some of our main cast of players. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Flash over to Carrie's home where yeah. we meet one of our final major players. Yeah. Carrie's mom. Yeah. Margaret White. Margaret White played in the version we saw by the incomparable Barbara Cook, played on Broadway by the incomparable Betty Buckley. Mhm. Mm and played in the movie by Piper Laurie. Carrie's mom is super duper religious. Mm -hmm. Yep. And they so they 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 pray a lot and Carrie's like Oh, snap, mom, I got my first period today. Isn't that wild? And the mom being, you know, just a beacon of support is like, oh, honey, I'm so sorry to hear that. Uh, here's a hot water bottle. Here's yeah. a sanitary napkin. Chocolate it's bar. Congrats. It's got a belt because it's the 70s. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no her mom's not real, actually. Her mom's really weird about it. No, her mom um, has this idea that basically if Carrie was actually pure in the eyes of the Lord, mm -hmm. she never would have gotten her period. This yeah. is yeah. this is the first sin of blood. Yeah. And it goes all the way back to that no good Nick Eve in the Garden yeah. of Eden. Yes. And so they sing the song called And Eve Was Weak, where oh, Carrie's mom yes. is punishing her for presumably sitting in some fashion, and that's why she got her period. Totally. So from there, we kind of... Yeah, you are punished. We move through the first act. We have some scenes where... The, uh, the kids who are making fun of her express kind of different um, amounts of comfort with mm -hmm. what they did. Sue yep. really feels weird. Chris really feels uh, very good about it. Yep. Um, we, meet, we meet their boyfriends then. Uh, yes. They're all at a drive-in. Um, and this is kind of, um, this is intercut 
with Carrie and uh, Carrie's mom, Mrs. White, praying and um, being very intensely religious. There's a juxtaposition there. It's very charming. Carrie gets shoved in the cellar to like the, like uh, the, yes. the sad yes. shame closet. So that's day one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we find ourselves at school the next day. And Mrs. Gardner is like, yeah. hey, all you girls, that was mean what you did to Carrie. But isn't like what I did sucks too. When I hit her. Yes, yeah. it does not acknowledge that. That's never acknowledged. No, no, um, no. She tells all the girls that, like, as punishment, they're going to have to, like, go to detention and yeah. they should all apologize to Carrie. Great. Yes. And so she gives all of the girls the opportunity to apologize to Carrie. Like, she kind of lines them up and then puts Carrie in the middle of the room, which, if there's any high school teachers uh, listening to this episode... <laughs> Don't. Don't do that. Never do that. Never, ever. If you see a kid that's, like, a little bit lonely and a little bit weird, the last thing you want to do is, you know... Put them in the middle of the room. Make everyone look at them. That's yeah. terrifying. Don't, don't do that. Don't, 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 don't. But okay, so she gives all of the students the chance to apologize to Carrie, and they all do it in a different kind of perfunctory way, Yeah. except for Chris. Yeah, Chris won't do it. So then Miss Gardner's like, well, fine then. You don't get to go to prom. Yeah. And Chris, is, um, Chris is grumpy about this. Correct. Then they sing a song. Then Miss Gardner's like, hey, Carrie, it'll be okay. Mm-hmm. Like, you're going to find someone who uh, really loves you um, yeah. because... Um, romantic love is the end goal of, yeah, um, every, of everything um, of everything at this point yeah. in time. Yes. I'm sure your main focus right now as a teenage girl is, man, I'm so depressed and my mom's really abusive. If only there were a Prince Charming that could take me away from all this. And they sing a song that is very, very 80s called Unsuspecting Hearts. Yes. Which I also so really like. But oh god! Just as a song, okay. as a song, in it, as a song itself, I really like. Oh, we're gonna have fun. There's something a little tonally weird about having your gym teacher sing this I with you. Know. But yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then we cut to Sue, to Sue Snell, who's the um the mean girl who actually feels bad about being mean, and she's like, "Man, I feel really bad about me being mean. I'm feeling a lot of uh, empathy for Carrie here. Tommy, my boyfriend." Do you think, why don't you take Carrie to prom instead of me? That, I bet that would make her really happy. Um, and Tommy's like, okay, sure. That's, that makes well, sense. Well, at first he's like, no. Right, yeah. <laughs> like, I want to go with you. My girlfriend, whom I love. Yeah. yeah. But then eventually he's like, no, that would be, that's a good idea. I'm a nice yeah. guy too. And goes and asks Carrie. Yeah. Goes, goes over to her house, asks her. And Carrie's like, okay, the, clearly this is some kind of trick. And Tommy's like, no, no, no. I, I actually really do want to take you to prom. And so Carrie ends up saying yes. And then tells her mom. And her mom's like, no, hell no. That's mm-hmm. a disaster. That's 10 disasters. Um, there's nothing worse in the world than sex or anything that approaches sex. Yes. Mm-hmm. And clearly a prom and going with a boy um, is super sexy. So yeah. absolutely not. Mm-hmm. And then what does Carrie do? She Yeah, she reveals yeah. her powers to her mom and is basically like... She like slams a door or a window or something. Yeah, yeah. she's like, okay, I love you, but... I'm going to prom mm-hmm. yeah. and just to show you that I can like take care of myself and also that there's not going to be an argument about this. Yeah. Ta-da! I have telekinesis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which as far as this goes is like the first time we become aware that she's conscious of so that she has control over her powers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like they've been sort of teasing it, but not in a way that I think is very well highlighted. Yeah, they don't tease it over, nearly as yeah. much as in the book. The book, they really ramp up to this. Yeah. Like in yeah. the book, in the book, you know, she is telekinesis, like from a very early point in the novel. Mm-hmm. Like you, you know, something funky is going on here, but in the musical, I think it's a combination of, a low special effects budget and also poor direction that we mm-hmm. really don't pick up on what's going on until Carrie says flat out in plain English, I'm magic. I mean, th- yeah. <laughs> one way or another, that's the end of act one. And yeah. you're like, oh, well, that was kind of nice. There were some weird moments. That opening number was weird. That unsuspecting yeah. heart song was weird. But in general, I'm having a good time. Mm-hmm. Let's see what act two has to offer. Mm-hmm. We open on act two <laughs> in a pig farm. Yeah. Where everyone's wearing shiny like skin tight jumpsuits yeah i there's like i have like a whole paragraph written down about my feelings on these costumes but yes for for some reason we open up on a pig farm with no it's just the worst with no pigs or farm imagery in sight we're really because there's no set in this goddamn unitards everywhere unitards (laughs) everywhere and a bunch of shirtless leather daddy backup dancers going i don't know just doing like their their best like chip and dale kind of dance there's a lot of gyrating. It's it's a very sexy number for oh. killing a pig and getting its blood, but... Because what's happening is Chris and... What's Chris's boyfriend's name again? Billy. Chris and Billy are like, I don't get to go to prom. It's all Carrie's fault. Let's kill a pig 
and um, dump the pig blood on her at prom. Yeah. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that's what this opening number is. And it's, I can't think of a weirder choice. Like maybe you could have had an actor playing the pig and that would have been weirder. But it beyond is- that, it's- <laughs> It is the most bizarre way to to illustrate what is going on. Yeah. Like if you didn't know what was going on, you'd be like, I I I why why is everyone so sexy? What is going on? Yeah. So, so many body roles. So that happens and you're like, all right, I get it. That was weird. What another bizarre choice, but I'm yeah. still on board. This musical's been fun. Mm-hmm. And the next number is Carrie getting ready for prom and making her dress, and that's all very charming. Yes. But then there's a whole sequence where she telekinesis is the dress and the dress dances with her, a disembodied dance. <laughs> okay, I kind of thought that effect was cool. Doesn't like the hairbrush fly in or the mi- oh, little yeah. mirror and stuff? Like... I, I liked the tamp dancing dress. I thought it was cool. <laughs> it's very bed knobs and broomsticks. It's very bed knobs and broomsticks. <laughs> Mostly, I was just like, okay, okay, special effects team. That's so, so you were in at this, but you were like, oh, there we go. I'm back on board. Because for me, this is where I stepped off the train. Mostly, mm. I was just happy yeah. to see some kind of demonstration that someone on the team understood, oh, we should probably show that she's telekinetic at some sure. point. Yeah. Right. And I guess it is sweet. It's nice to see Carrie happy and excited. That's very important. Yeah. That we know that she's happy and excited. Yes. yes. So then her mom is like, really, you shouldn't go. Yeah. And she's like, no, really, I'm going to go. Yeah. And she goes. And her mom's like... Well, I guess I have to kill her now. Yeah, there's only one thing left <laughs> to do. Well, okay, so her, because of her mom's like kind of religious mania, she's yeah. like, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. She thinks yeah. her daughter's a witch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she's like, okay, well, it is my good Christian duty to kill my own daughter. Yeah. And this is accurate to the book as well. Yep. And um, yeah. the book is, this is what's really, in my opinion, most interesting about the Carrie myth, because this is my take. This is what this has become. This story has become a myth more than an mm-hmm. adaptation. We'll get into that more later. Um, what's interesting about the Carrie myth is mrs white in her arc and yeah mm-hmm. she's such a she's the real villain of this and it's so yes. interesting to watch yeah anyways they get to the prom and um everyone does a dance in three lines and it looks like a high school production yeah it's called right? what a night it's called what a night um w-o-t-t-a night yeah. what, a, what, what a night what a night what a night and they get to the dance and like carrie looks good and everyone's like nice everyone's to her. like whoa yeah you're like great what a happy story this is. This is fantastic. I've never the heard of end. Carrie before. Yeah. The end. Curtain falls. Um, Carrie's having a great time. Good for yeah. Carrie. <laughs> um, so much so that Carrie ends up winning the ballot for prom queen. Okay, so it. I don't think it's it's super clear in this version of the story. But this is mm-hmm. how it goes in the book. Yeah. But Tommy and Sue were like more in the running to be prom king and yes. queen because they're like the nice popular kids Mm -hmm. because Tommy was still in the running that made whoever his date was also in the running Mm. and then also but also Chris rigs the ballot this is what I was gonna bring up to make sure that Carrie wins because I thought Chris pulls some strings to uh, make sure that Carrie's name is on the ballot and that she Mm -hmm. wins so that she can be part of this prank but very important no one else is in on that yes in general the high school population is just like great Carrie White good for Carrie yeah great uh, because as, as established in the opening number, everyone in high school cares more about themselves than someone else. Mm-hmm. This yeah. is really important, and this is why I think the heart of this musical works, even though <laughs> this musical doesn't work. Anyways. <laughs> um, they get up on stage, everyone sings the school song, it's very nice, and then Chris's boyfriend dumps a cup of red dye on Carrie? Yeah, yeah, Billy <laughs> and Chris. I think Chris shouts like, do it now. And That's then, 2012, and then I think. I think in this one, they just oh, run on. Oh, I don't know. Chris ran on with Billy on the other side, yep. ripped her dress, I think. Like she did, yeah. Chris did something with her dress. Maybe she put blood on the dress. Yeah. They, they recreate that famous scene from the Brian De Palma movie where a small cup of blood is um, <laughs> poured down Carrie's back. <laughs> yes. We're making a joke because obviously it's the most iconic thing yeah. About all of Carrie's iconography that she gets an enormous a bucket of pig's blood, pig's blood dumped like, all over her. From yeah. what yeah. I understand, they were trying to t- like troubleshoot this and be like, okay, how can we dump a bucket of blood on Carrie and not have her mic short out? How, can yes. we, how do we avoid a giant puddle of sticky corn syrup on the stage for the yeah. rest of the show? And this was the solution they went with, and I don't think it works very well. Oh, no. Not at all. When we get to the set and the props and the special effects, we'll talk about this versus the 2012. Mm-hmm. I'd like to raise in advance that I asked a dear friend of the podcast, Ali Fulmick, about this. Mm. I just laid down the variables and asked them to solve for it. Yes. And they solved with the 2012 solution, mm. which is very interesting. That's not the solution they used here. We'll talk about that in a bit, but it is just the one of the final disasters in a ring of disasters. So very underwhelming. She's had a small glass of pig's blood dumped on her back. Yeah. A Dixie cup. Yeah. <laughs> And in the original story, everyone 
laughs because they don't know what else to do. Yeah. Not not out of malice. Right. And she takes that as, oh, everyone was in on this. Yes. And gets very upset. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like that's the really important thing that I think is a very difficult nuance to mm-hmm. portray on stage. That people aren't laughing because like, haha, Carrie got it. It was... Like, you're laughing because you just, out of shock. Yes. More than anything else. Yeah, so that's not super well portrayed on stage, but that's I that that's the heart of the story at any rate. Mm-hmm. And Carrie goes bananas and um, telekinesis is everyone to death, right? It's really hard to tell on stage what she's actually yeah. doing. Um, like, physically. Jill, Jill just threw her arms to her sides. <laughs> yes. Which is an accurate depiction of what they do in physically, this stage show. Basically, she, yeah, she just does arm stuff and the lasers behind her do the rest. Yeah, yeah it looks like full on Pink Floyd laser light show. Yes. Yeah. And it is so unclear what is actually happening. Yeah. And everyone dies except for Sue Snell, who wasn't at prom. And she was like outside looking in. Because wasn't that the, yeah, the, the, the figure the, they that they bring you a scrim see? down and she's on the outside yeah, watching like, everyone yeah. die? Oh my god! Um, yeah, because <laughs> it's important to this story that Sue Snell stays alive. Not important to this version. We'll get no. into this, correct? But it is definitely yeah. it's very important to the story the way it's originally framed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we're almost done. Almost everyone's dead. We go back to Carrie's house. Well, we go back to the ghostly void. I thought we went to a staircase coming in. Yep, that, that's what I mean. Like, there's like a... Right. I thought that was at the school. It's so hard to tell what's going on. It I lo- think it looks it's like, a school staircase. It looks like full-on stairway to heaven. All right. of a sudden, yeah. Margaret White is at the top of the stairs. Yes. She meets her mom. Um, on these stairs. <laughs> Barbara Cook is almost killed by these stairs and promptly quits the production. Um, yes, th- that is the staircase is, is they're talking yep, about. Absolutely. Yep. And so then Margaret White stabs Carrie. And Carrie telekine- telekinetically... Stops her mom's heart. Yeah, and she just sort of falls. Yeah, falls backward. Which again, on stage, looks a little bit like force choke, and then Margaret White just falls over. Yeah, <laughs> it's so crazy. Uh, kind no, of. And then, and then Carrie gets to the bottom of the stairs yeah. and collapses in Sue's arms. Yeah. Yeah. She slides on her stomach down the stairs. Wee, Did you notice that? Like a little penguin. <laughs> I was like, I kind of want to do that. <laughs> I was very checked out by this point. Yes. <laughs> and then the curtain falls, and then we're done. Yeah. Whew, wow. Well done, y'all. If we wanted to license Carrie the musical, yeah. it's worth noting the only version that would be for license is the 2012 revision. But let's say we wanted to license Carrie the musical, what would it say? So I took this synopsis from Wikipedia, actually, because it's nice and concise. Great. Gets us to the point. Here it is. Adapted from Stephen King's 1974 novel, Carrie, it focuses on an awkward teenage girl with telekinetic powers whose lonely life is dominated by an oppressive religious fanatic mother. When she is humiliated by her classmates at the high school prom, she unleashes chaos on everyone and everything in her path. You know what's so interesting about that? And this is going to point to, we're going to talk about the book in a second, Mm -hmm. which is one of the most significant problems with this. It implies that the telekinetic destruction is an enormous part of the story. Mm -hmm. And it is an enormous part of the story. Um, Anyone who's seen the Brian De Palma or has read the book knows it's Everything is leading up to this moment. Mm -hmm. Um, In the book especially, we don't know what happened. We just know something happened. I'm going to get Daph to talk about the book in just one second. But in both adaptations, especially in this one, but even in the 2012, this climax is like 90 seconds long. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. very underwhelming. And it's an enormous problem. Whereas this synopsis very much implies the heart of the story, which is this is actually a big deal. Mm Mm-hmm. Is there any more context we need to give about Carrie the Musical before we dive in? I'm sure it's all going to come out as we talk about this. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. This is, dear listeners, at least for me, this is the most excited and into and interested in a musical I've been that we've covered on this show since probably Parade. So I have so much to say and it's not very well organized in my (laughs) brain. So thank you for your patience. Thank you for your patience, my dear colleagues. And thank you to our... uh, guest host slash producer Daphne who's yeah. gonna, it's gonna be fun keep later. us on track Better after woo okay let's talk about the book music and lyrics hell yeah let's do it based on the novel by Stephen King music by Michael Gore lyrics by Dean Pitchford yep footloose guy right you're totally right you caught me by surprise because I was getting excited for Michael Gore, who did all the music for Fame. Oh, sure. So um, we have a Fame and we have we a Footloose. We did a Fame and we have a Footloose, yeah. <gasps> Fantastic. I also um, like his name because it works well with the horror element. His name is Michael Gore and there's a lot of blood. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> I wish Dean Pitchford's last name was Pitchfork. 
Right? Just would, stay on theme. That would help us a lot. A uh, book by Lawrence D. Cohen. Music was orchestrated by Anders Elias, who we've talked about before. Oh, yeah. He does a Harold nice job. Wheeler and Michael Starobin. Really? A young... Not even a young Starobin at this point. A Starobin just getting to the height of his powers. Not unlike our protagonist. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a little known fact, Michael Strohm, famed Broadway orchestrator, is also telekinetic. Yes. So there's yes. that as well. <laughs> they share that. <sighs> that's how he conducts. He just holds the holds a little bit. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what he orchestrates and he conducts at the same time. It's yes. amazing. It's, it's very, it's incredible to see. Look up some videos. Real time. <laughs> okay. Let's, let's definitely start with the book because okay. we have to tackle like the adaptation as yeah. well as the script here. Yes. So. Daphne, can you tell us a little bit about the novel? One of the most interesting things about Carrie as a novel versus its adaptations is that with the exception of the 2012 revival, none of them use the framing device of Sue Snell in an interrogation room mm -hmm. repeating what has happened on prom night to what we learn in the in the book is the White Committee. Sorry, Paul is raising his hand. Yes, Paul. The 2002 TV movie also does do that. Oh, out. great. Okay. It's not a good adaptation, but it also does that. But it's still something that not a lot of adaptations choose to do. Mm -hmm. Whereas the book is like, now there's a, there's a term that's been used for it on Wikipedia that it's like apostolary, I think it is. Okay. Which means it's, it's written in such a way where it's a mix of real time yeah. prose and narration mixed with like snippets from a fake book written about Carrie. Ooh, okay. Like, about like yeah. the white incident or like what happened on prom night. And it's like interspersed with just like research about telekinesis and a biography uh, on Carrie's life. And then you, we cut back to the present where all of this is happening. And mm. yeah. it's, it's interesting that a lot of adaptations don't go for that. Because right. I think it adds, adds a little, adds a little spice to I the mix. I think it does Absolutely. too. Yeah. I think I would even hazard to say it's part of what gives Carrie this mythological quality mm -hmm. where it's almost a campfire story yeah. at this point. Yeah. When you think about Carrie, you think about these beats you have to hit. Mm -hmm. um, Carrie gets her period and girls are mean to her. Yep. There's a teacher that's nice to her. Her mom is very intense. One of the nice popular girls convinces her to boyfriend to take her to prom. Mm -hmm. These major beats of a yep. story. And then within that, you play as you can. Mm -hmm. Yes. What do you think about this book? the book of this musical and the structure of this musical as an adaptation of that myth and that novel. I don't mind that we don't do the interrogation thing. Like, sure. I, 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 like I don't think we miss it. Like, it's just, it's more just interesting to me that so many adaptations don't do that. Yes. It definitely feels more like it's a mashup of the book and the movie than just mm. the book or just the movie. I see. Just in terms of, like, what they keep and what they get rid of. Yeah. It's, it's more interesting what they chose to change. Because, like, Sue and Chris are not best friends in the novel. No. Mm. Nope. They're just, like, two popular girls who exist on the same like social caste system but yeah. like they're not they're not buds no it's interesting how much of the focus is not on carrie for so much of this book i agree there's a lot of focus on chris in fact yeah um, and talking mm. about chris's motivation i call the book a much more of an exploration of why teenagers are mean yeah. yeah you know which i think is also just kind of something you need to kind of almost just like accept as part of a kingism that like there's going to be this sadistic bully that is really really mean to our protagonist like absurdly mean to our protagonist and in this case too because mrs white is the other bully yeah and you're not really gonna find out too much about their motivation yeah. mm -hmm. like i think there's like a couple lines at some point in this script where it's like why do you hate carrie so much you know because she's a freak it's like right. we don't really get like a deeper sense of chris's motivations apart from just carrie sucks yeah. Ooh, yeah. Carrie. Jill, as mm -hmm. someone who hasn't read the novel but yeah. has um, seen the um, the famous Brian De Palma adaptation, yeah. what's your take on this book and this structure? I struggle with this script, I think, yeah. a lot. Like the dialogue. Yeah, absolutely. It just, in all the iterations, has lost what makes Stephen King's novel so great. And I feel like because it, we need to tie it up in like, you know, an hour and 45 minutes, mm -hmm. it's, there's, there's some things that just get lost or convoluted and um, si oversimplification of a lot of things mm -hmm. yes. in this script. And yeah. I think there are songs where there should be dialogue yep. and maybe vice versa sometimes. Mm -hmm. I'm inclined to agree. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. so I think that's how I feel about this book. 
the script. I should specify, I know that some of our listeners, and actually this applies for this very specifically. Yeah, because we're talking about both a book and... A book and a book. (laughs) So book being script of the musical. Yes. And then book also being... Novel. Um... I couldn't agree more with both of you. I think it's a lot of weird choices. Mm-hmm. We'll get to the music in a second. I think the music is much more on track with telling the story that should be told rather than the book is. Mm-hmm. The book, in a lot of ways, makes really bizarre choices in how to use that music. Mm-hmm. Makes some um, really bizarre choices in what bits to highlight, where Carrie's relationship with uh, Mrs. Gardner is really, really explored. And that's, yeah. I know that's a part of the original story, but, but I don't what does that actually say it... about? You know what I mean? Like, why why is it so important to know there was one teacher who was nice to her? At least in, in like, this adaptation, it's because Miss Gardner is giving her the kind of kindly mom figure she's never had. Y- yes. But how does that help? What does that actually do for the it story? It doesn't really help, exactly. It's, it think, makes people feel comfortable watching it. Exactly. Right. It's a, it's a ploy. Yeah, I think it's hard for people to accept that there was this poor girl that nobody wanted to help except yeah. for like Sue. And like, even Sue won't help her directly. Not really. It's and like really strange. Like Sue isn't like, hey Carrie, do you want to like come hang out after school? She's yeah. like, I will give up my prom night nobly so yeah. that you can have a good time. <laughs> it's also like like we were referring to the like the slap moment of Miss Gardner. Like I can't. Which is also from the original novel, I believe. Yes. Yeah. But it's also but like the reason why I bring that up is because in the original novel, I think there's like a line that Miss Gardner or the, the coach was like, I just, I don't know. I just saw her like stupid face and I just like wanted to slap her. And it was yeah, like. That's a line <laughs> in the novel. Absolutely it is. Oh, God. Yeah, it's, it's something it's like that bizarre. where it's like no one's immune from picking on Carrie. Like no one, yeah, no one's really a good person when it comes Carrie's to. It's Carrie's fault because of like her face. Yeah. Like, <laughs> is this weird primal thing of like picking on Carrie because she's weak yeah, yeah. and yeah. not and like not not being able to stand how weak she is yeah. and getting kind of almost angry at her for not being stronger right. and better oh, but yeah it's just it's, it's it's a very it's a very dense characterization that's really hard to explore yeah. on, on the stage and so here's my thing because that's all good and well if it's all leading up to this enormous climax where um Carrie uh, just demolishes the gym. And this is why the Brian yeah. De Palma movie, for all its pros and cons, really works. Because that scene is just like, wow, 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 wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and in all of these adaptations, you just, you end up being like, what's the point of this? Mm-hmm. Because the there's no emotional catharsis that's provided from the destruction at the gym. Because it's nothing. Everything we're leading up to, it doesn't matter if anyone was nice to carry or mean to carry. Right. Because it's just... If you were there, you were... Then yeah. Carrie got grumpy and for a minute and a half there were some flashing lights. There's no poignancy to that Mm. end. So the whole arc is all fucked up. But actually, maybe that's the beauty of it. Go into more detail. That's interesting. Well, I don't know. Like, maybe the culmination of the story is just another um, way to illustrate things that was... There are the things that were illustrated previously in the book. Yeah. Like the things that you were just talking about. Like, I know that there was one sure. scholar of the book that referred to it as a revenge tragedy, and another referred to it as revenge fantasy. Yeah. Ooh, sure. Okay. Yeah, like, the point of the story isn't yes. those kids were mean to carry and they got what was coming to them. Yeah. Right. The point of the story is that this deeply traumatized girl reached a breaking point and mm-hmm. ended up just lashing out at everyone. Yes. Yeah. With no nuance because she was just in so much pain. Yeah. So this so this is this Ooh, is what okay. I'm saying. That lash out is nothing in the musical. Yes. So the and the end of that arc feels right. unfinished. Which I think is yeah. yeah. actually a good thing. Okay. Yeah. Based on what Daph just said. Yeah. I think actually maybe we could make that a good thing. So does this book work for you? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, but but I think there's maybe more to it, and I love that about it. Yeah, like I love yeah, that yeah. we can keep talking about it, and we'll yeah. probably talk about this forever. Yeah. yeah. My only thing is, that I think it's a mistake to and take from Carrie. Those mean old kids got what got what was coming. Yeah. to Yeah, I think yeah. that's the only incorrect read of of this story. Yes, sure. It's, even that's why I don't like the the moments in the book where Carrie's like, they're gonna know my name, and like they're gonna get yeah. it. It's like that's not. Right. That's not the point. Like, yeah. That, that's a misunderstanding of this character to yes. be like, I'm going to get revenge on all of you consciously. That's like, yeah, there's like, like a consciously knowing. want. Yeah. 
That's so interesting because that's not how I've all, I've read. That's not how I read the song Carrie. I read it as because it comes out of her hearing them call her scary white all the time. She's just yeah. literally like, just treat me like a person. Yes. Someday you're actually going to say my name like it's like properly like what my name is. That's more of the read that I'm talking about. Right. But without that, that, that component of like, yes. I'm going to put your face in the dirt and make you say my name correctly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally. So if we had to rate this book, uh-huh. if we had to assign it a numerical value, yeah, um, how based on we how well that? we, uh, based on how well we think it functions within the context of this show, um, as well as within the context of um, this uh, larger carry myth, mm-hmm. and let's say we wanted to measure it um, out of ten playbills. Oh, sure. Um, how many monkeys would you give it out of those ten playbills? Mm, monkeys um, to playbills. Monkeys to playbills. Guests, uh, guests first. What would you say? Okay, so out of Ten programs. <laughs> out of ten what? Out of ten programs, I'm not I would sure give what that this is, please. book. <laughs> um, D- Daphne, Daphne, producer Daphne. Yes. Um, I said playbills. Okay, and I thought we were doing a podcast called Apes and Programs. <laughs> <laughs> so out of ten programs, how many apes would you give this? Um, <laughs> what would you give this? What? Out of ten playbills, I would give this book like six monkeys. Okay. I'm also reading it a little bit more harshly. As an adaptation, yeah. mm-hmm. not just like on its own merits, but yeah. I, I'm going to go with a six. I would go lower. Yeah, me too. I would say um, I would give it a four at best. Oh, Very and good. I'm right in the middle. Five. Boom. Four, five, six. I'm sure there's got to be a sound cue for that. Is I'm there... sorry. <laughs> 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 I'm just going to go on freesound.org and just go randomize and just whatever I find. <laughs> Okay, but there's also music in this. This is a musical. What? There's some music. Yeah. Oh, there's is a, there... there's a lot of music there's actually. There's a lot of yeah. music. Quite a bit. Can we talk about it? Yeah. Do you yes. want to go first? Oh, I would love to. Okay, you go first. Um, I unabashedly, almost without exception, love the music in this show. Ooh. I really, really, really love the 2012 revision and revival, and I think it is fascinating because I started listening to that first before I dived in dove into this original version for the podcast. Oh, okay. I think it's fascinating how they adapted it to that version. And so I feel affinity for the songs and um, these original songs in that way. Mm-hmm. I also find these original songs very charming in their own 80s way. And so when the opening number comes on and it's this 80s bop, even though it's a lot of weird choices are made in executing that, <laughs> I'm just there for it. I'm just <laughs> loving life. I love the um, Carrie soliloquy, like the second song in the show. I think it's really strong, as I just alluded to. I think Unsuspecting Hearts is a great song. Okay. I think that everything... <laughs> I... Sorry. Yep. I can't help myself. I just really hate it. I just hate that song. And I think that everything that Margaret White is given to do is incredible. I think that's an incredible track. Oh, wow. Okay. We are Jill, do you disagree? <laughs> Mom, Dad, stop fighting. <laughs> Okay, I agree completely about the style stuff you were saying. Stylistically, it pokes my brain in the right way. We know I love the 80s. I love, like, the electric guitar of that. I would, I must mention that the orchestrations are actually what makes this music for me. You can so clearly hear the strings, you can hear the flutes, you can hear, like, there is some beautiful showcasing of these musicians, and I think that helps me. Um, feel really connected to this music. Yep. And I would love to actually hear it performed by a large band I agree. sometime in the near future. Maybe yep. we can make that happen. I really think there's too much Margaret singing. Very interesting. I think Margaret sings like five very similar like arias because that's how they are to me. Yeah. They are very similar. They're very yeah. like... Having sex is bad. Mm-hmm. Biblical, woman is bad. Biblical, and they're all biblical. the same like tempo and they all just yeah. sort of like sit the same. And, yeah, that's very fair. And I love Barbara Cook, but I don't think she was the right vocal choice for it. That I can agree with. Because Absolutely. I because I think about all of the people who have come after her to play this role. Like, who did we have? Okay, so we had Betty Buckley, and when you hear her on that sizzle reel um, of the... It's really cool. Like, it's like, that's very I'm exciting. I'm like, yes, that. I hate the sound of her voice. And you're supposed to, I think. Mm. Yeah. But whereas with Barbara Cook, it's like stunningly beautiful lullabies all the time. And I'm like, oh, whatever. Anyway, too, too many ballads for Margaret, and I just get a little bored of yeah. Margaret's stuff. I respect that. Um, but I pretty much love everything else except that weird duet and yeah. um, the reprise to that weird duet. Unsuspecting Hearts? <laughs> reprise. <laughs> oh, 
I kind of want, I'm going to go find the music and play it at home. I like it so much. I think okay. it's a really well-written 80s pop song. Oh, but It Hurts yep. to Be Strong, which is Sue's song in Act 2. <laughs> oh, yeah. I might put it in my book, actually. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> we hate everything else the other person loves I'm on gonna, this show. <laughs> I'm going to make you love that song. It's going in my Not book. Not interested. All right. Daph. Daph, what do you think of this music? <laughs> I, I don't like it. No! I don't like it. No. no! None of it? Okay, not none of it. Okay. I, I, I like parts of it. Sure. I just like, I think, like the first thing I wrote down is, it's the 80s, baby! <laughs> oh yeah, is it ever? And there's that's no why question about it. Like in that overture, you're like, oh, there's the synth, there's mm. the guitars, yeah. we're in the 80s. Oh, yeah. it's like, we actually are in the 80s, so I'm like, okay, it's fine. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, my big note, I think, was just Lindsay Haley, who plays mm-hmm. Carrie in the mm-hmm. Stratford version. And the Broadway version. And the Broadway version. I really wish she had more of, like, a legit quality to her voice. Oh, oh. sure. Like, because when, when we hear Margaret singing, she has this very, like, church lady mm-hmm. tone to her voice. Absolutely. And I wish we heard more of that coming out of Lindsay Haley. Oh. I don't mind that we don't some of the time. Like, yeah. when she's doing some verse soliloquies, it's like, okay, yeah. this is when you sound more like... You know, like an average teenage girl. Yeah. yeah. I just wish we kind of heard more of that in her because I, it would have been nice to kind of see that blend of church lady and that's contemporary. A take. I love that take. I've never thought. Oh, that's fascinating. Because across the board, Carrie's portrayed as, like in the case of the 1980s, a power mixer turning mm-hmm. into like a, mm-hmm. a screlter. Yes. Which has always kind of been, when you compare the 2012 Carrie to its um, contemporaries, yeah. um, like Heathers and Mean Girls, mm-hmm. it's just... We're going to make these ladies screlt the yes. day away. And I think that's a mistake because yeah. that's... Carrie is not like Veronica Sawyer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Carrie is not Katie Heron. Yeah. C- Carrie is her own person. And I think that that's... Very the, different arcs. That's also yeah. the mistake I think the 2012 revival does. And one of the reasons why I don't like the music in that. What a good Because it's trying too hard to be Mean Girls and Heathers with yeah. the kind of more rock influences. Yeah. And that's just... Ew. No. <laughs> interesting. And we've and we've done that. Like Heathers does that really well. Mm-hmm. Heathers is yeah. a really interesting show. We don't need like Heathers, but now we're talking about Martha Dump Truck. Like we don't that's <laughs> I don't <laughs> I don't I don't need that from this show. So yeah. I wish they kind of I wish they kind of kept more of that church lady quality to Lindsay Haley's voice. Um, mm. I also kind of agree that like, I think that th- some of those decisions of where to put songs make sense for me mm-hmm. and some of them really don't. Yeah. I think having, I think unsuspecting hearts makes sense dramaturgically, even if I'm still a little weirded out by how long we spend. I was going to say, it is so Talking about her dance break. Yeah. Like, do we need it? It's kind of a lot. Well, it's it's this weird thing where it feels like they decided, oh, we need a love duet, even though Carrie's arc is not really a romantic arc. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we need a love duet in a show. They're like trying to make it. So let's give Carrie a love duet with an imaginary partner. An aspirational love duet. Represented by this teacher. Also just... We, we, we pick our times to use the ensemble in really weird oh, moments. Oh, yes, we do. <laughs> yes, we do. Between Do Me a Favor and uh, Out for Blood slash Cracker Jack, like oh, the songs God. where Sue Sue is trying to cajole Tommy into asking out Carrie and mm-hmm. Chris is trying to ask Billy to help her with the blood plan. Yeah. It's like, wh- why do you need backup dancers for this? This like this should be a four-person number. It should be a four-person number. It should be Chris and Billy going to go get the blood. We don't yeah. need the ensemble right now. <laughs> We'll get, we'll get into the staging in the choreo when we get into the staging in the choreo. Yeah. I agree completely. I think that's a really interesting take. Something to think on for a bit. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't disagree. I think there's a lot of, a lot of value there. I love a good Skrelt. I love a Waylon <laughs> yeah, early do. 20s um, <laughs> AFAB performer singing about yeah. how they've been bullied, but man, they sing really well. I just, <laughs> I also like it. I just don't think it fits this character. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's a really fair take. Yeah. This is going to be a really varied um scoring system oh yeah are we gonna separate music and lyrics in our scoring or can we, we safely talk about put the them lyrics. together the lyrics are so bad i wasn't super distracted by them i'll say some of the lyrics we hear nowadays in musicals are just so bad and especially since we've been covering like some of those contemporary shows written by rock musicians yeah. where mm. lyrics are just like so not story driven i feel like at least some of these we, we get from a to b Sometimes I think like okay, so I really I, like the lyrics <laughs> across the board. <laughs> Love them. <laughs> so okay, here's my problem with some of the lyrics. Anytime we're with the teenagers, mm-hmm. like not not even Carrie, like specifically like all the teenagers who aren't Carrie, the show is doing this weird thing where it's like trying to be satirical. Oh, sure. But, but they're like supposed to be sixteen or seventeen years old. Yeah, and it's just like <laughs> teenagers. Yep. What are they? What are they like? Being thin. 
talking about the difficulties of consent and whether or not to give up your virginity to your boyfriend? Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's, that's what the teenagers <laughs> <what> do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I remember reading this thing that was like, anytime the audience laughed, the director cut that line. Yeah, this totally. Is uh, so apparently, exactly that. Every night, these um, they treated these uh, the Stratford upon um, Avon tryout as a super preview yeah. and did like full days of rehearsal every day where they revamped yeah. the show. Yeah, including exactly that cutting so funny. every line that had gotten a laugh. Yeah, every like, night. crazy. A laugh isn't a bad thing. But like, that was the thing is that audiences were responding to the show like it was camp. And the director mm. was like, no, bad, shut it down. But Which then we is... have all these, these lyrics that are like striking this weird blend between satire and you want me to take this seriously? Yeah. I'm so confused. Right. One way or another, I think we're all in agreement. The director's decision to try to take out the laughs is a bad one. I it's think a so. It's also just fighting a losing battle, man. It like, is. Y- totally. You gotta just roll with that. Yeah. I think there's even, there's something inherently absurd about a horror musical. To taking something, taking two genres that are so steeped in artifice <laughs> yeah. and combining them. Right. As creators, we have to accept at some point that's going to be silly. That doesn't mean yeah. it can't be scary as well. Yeah. But it's going to be silly. So yeah. make your piece. You guys might have just lowered my um, rating of the music and lyrics by, by, a, oh, very by, a, um, by a monkey. Ooh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, let's go. Uh, let's do it. Out of 10 playbills, Paul, we should start with you. Um, How many monkeys are you giving the music yes. and lyrics? I'm giving it seven. It was going to be an eight. Mm. Okay. Um, here's my take. I think that the music keeps the tongue-in-cheek tone that would make this work. Yep. Um, as we discussed, there's something inherently absurd about um, a horror musical, and you have to lean into that just a little bit to actually make it scary. Mm-hmm. I think the lyrics don't do that, and that's a problem. So seven is where I'm going to settle. Eight for the music, six for the lyrics. We'll find ourselves at a seven. Yeah. What about either of you? Daph? I'm going to have to go with a three. What? <gasps> Sorry. Fair. Oh Good. My okay. God. Oh Very my fair. God. <laughs> okay, and, and like, because, like, okay, mostly because I don't, always like where they put the songs i don't always like the content of the songs i think that we don't use our stage time very wisely yeah i just i I was looking at my notes and i was like oh yeah we decided to cover up major plot developments with this fluffy song about like at the drive-in like don't waste the moon yeah that song's bad it's not not the song's fault it's the fact that we're trying to put this campy song about like we're a teenager is having a fun night out at the drive-in over top of this major plot development of sue being like i feel really bad about carrie i should do something about it yeah and chris being like man carrie sucks i wish i could do something that's important stuff that we're covering up with this song yes I also might be biased in that regard because drive-ins are one of my favorite things in the world. I yes. used to go to the drive-in all the time as the kid and I missed the drive-in. So yes. then when you saw the bunch of cars Just as soon there, as we start to think about drive-ins, I'm like, oh, that's Forget happy. everything that's a else. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a three, though. I, I'm sticking with a three. A three. Wow. I'm sticking with a three. Jeez. Jill, where are you going? Well, I, like you, had a really um, yeah. positive reaction to the music in general. Again, yeah. those orchestrations like were yeah. so well crafted. Absolutely. So I landed at an eight musically, but the lyrics are like a four. Yep. Maybe a five. So, so what does go? that make me? Like a six and a half? Yeah. Ish? Let's go six and a half. Like I'm happy to call it a oh. six and a half and then defend my choice to anyone named Daphne. <laughs> <laughs> I need to defend my choice and name Paul and Jill. Oh, that's such an interesting spread. I don't disagree, Daph. I know exactly what you're um, what you're saying. I think my love for the '80s and yeah. for this composer yes, and this yeah. style of composing means that I can't get too far away from loving it. Couldn't agree more. One last thing we should mention on the subject of the music. Yes. Friend of the podcast, Riverdale the Show, did a whole arc where they were doing Carrie as a high school musical. Released a music video of, of cast of Riverdale doing the opening number. I would encourage everyone to go watch it. And then just tell us how you feel. Tell us how you feel. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to influence feel? you with our yeah. um, opinions, be they positive or negative. Who can say? But I would love to hear what you think of the, specifically the root cast of Riverdale's music video for In, the opening number from Carrie. All right. Should we do the uh, direction and choreo? <laughs> we got to be careful. I could talk about this I literally know. all day. Okay. <laughs> Directed by Terry Hands, who had never directed a musical ever, and I don't believe... Directed since? I hope not. Well, based on that article you sent, it didn't seem like he really wanted to touch musical theater again for a while. (laughs) Uh, Musical director, Paul Schwartz. 
And chore- choreography by my favorite, Debbie Allen. She is one of my favorite dancers of all time. So do you like this choreo? Well... I was gonna. I was gonna say my first thought was gonna be, "Don't worry, this will go quick because it's easy. The direction's bad. The choreo's bad." Okay. Well, and now <laughs> so I know how you feel. Take. Go ahead. Yeah. I love aerobics. It's my new favorite form of physical activity. Mm-hmm. Great. Ab- what a good, healthy, heart healthy, body healthy. Yeah. yeah, I love it. Always have. I remember my mom doing it a lot. Yeah. I didn't know you could do aerobics as choreography until this musical. Mm-hmm. Over the last few days, I was like, "Oh, actually, I love this sometimes." <laughs> chaotic it's There's, it's absolute chaos yeah. There's so much of it yeah it's like too much of it but the essence of it i like i like it i i love it but but like debbie allen and i love you but not everyone can sing purely and beautifully while doing a double inside pirouette like it's yep. not fun for everyone to do well and in general isn't the whole point of aerobics even though like I know aerobics and um, jazz style choreo have some similarities mm-hmm. in movement. Yes. The whole point of actual aerobic workouts is to boost your heart rate to its max virtually instantly. Yeah. And um, take you off your breath, make you short of breath. Yeah, you're that's, not supposed to be able to speak. That's literally what it's designed for. When you're doing for. aerobics. Surprise, surprise, they had trouble singing. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I just, and I mean, there's no question that these dancers can do it. That's mm-hmm. not the, the argument. It's not that. You're watching people struggle to meet Debbie Allen's expectations of movement. It just doesn't really it's not make sense. It's not freaking possible. <laughs> it's not. This whole, these whole movements are designed to, no matter what your fitness level is, push your heart rate to the max. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not a matter of they're just not in good enough shape. Yeah, no. This is, they've been set an impossible task. Yeah. Also, if they're not in good enough shape, who the hell is? This is I what know. I mean. These are yeah. Broadway caliber dancers. It's it's incredible. Outside of Olympic athletes, they're in the best shape of anyone in the world. And then the funny thing to me, even if we're just looking at the opening number, is the fact that there is a dance break in it, but the whole thing is danced. So I'm like, why do we need a dance There's break? Just like a weird soloist moment. Yeah, where- like it oh. doesn't change the dynamic at all. Or Mrs. Is, Gardner yeah. just riffs. Oh, She's God. got riffs for days. Oh, no, I mean, like, there's like a soloist dancer soloist. who's also just oh, like... Oh, that's right. Yes, totally, totally. It's like, yeah. why? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I just, I love it. I love it now that I'm older and I've, I don't know. And I also just love Debbie Allen and yeah, just watching her instruct and teach is just amazing and she sets the bar really high, but she does that because people climb to it. Okay, can I ask both of you a question? Yes. Um, Jill, you're a um, you're one of my favorite directors and choreographers. Daphne, Thank you. you're one of my favorite directors. You both stage really well. You both um, I've seen productions. Both of you have um, staged. You have a strong idea of how to make an interesting stage picture. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Was there there's something bad about the staging, both of the direction and choreo in this show? Right. Like there's a way of staging this show on a blank stage. Where I'm not quite so aware of how blank it is. Right? Yes. And like it felt like all the choreo were just, there were lines. Mm-hmm. It felt like lines of people, which is the yeah. most uninteresting. It looks like a high school yes. staging. At one point they do the can-can in this opening number. Oh my god, yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah, they actually do. Full kick line. Yeah. Give it all away in the opening number. Full on Rockettes moment. So that's what struck me. I'm not a very discerning consumer when it comes to staging. If it looks nice, I'm having fun. And watching this, I was like... I hate this. Mm -hmm. This looks, everything about these pictures looks uninteresting and boring and doesn't grab my attention. It's also busy. Like I have this, Mm. like when we have that moment where like the light breaks in the, in the, in like with the slap, you barely notice the light breaks at all. True. Because like the direction takes away from that moment by like not highlighting it in any specific way. Exactly. Like the focus is downstage on the slap and we just hear like, it's like someone played a smashing sound effect when yeah. Gardner's like hand connects and you're like, that was really weird. Yeah, I agree. I think the direction, uh, like the choreo, is so busy. And I wonder if Terry Hands, our director who had never done a musical, was like maybe deferring to Debbie Allen a little bit, who's a very accomplished mm-hmm. musical theater performer. And so I wonder if maybe there was a bit of like lack of knowledge about staging a musical in general and focus and yeah, yeah I don't Debbie know. Ellen's got a ton of responsibility dumped on yeah. her and she's very much movement focused. So that's the medium she's going to work with. Totally. Even if it's inappropriate to have that much busyness in a, in a book scene. Yeah, but Terry's yeah. not there to be like, or not confident maybe enough to say, 
Maybe you see that we all the time with um, directors who haven't directed musicals before. Yeah, they have yeah. trouble even engaging with movement within music. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. That's not a bad diagnosis, y'all. I mean, we get rid of the leather daddy Chippendale dancers, Debbie Allen. Oh. Why? <laughs> <laughs> We're like, okay, we can send them to Jill's house later. But yeah. like, can we just, no, I know. can we yes. not? <laughs> they were supposed to be in high school too, which is the other thing that really That's threw me That's also just gross. Yeah. I was like, there's yeah. a lot That was of... both bad and gross. Yeah. Yeah. Save the sexy stuff, st- sexy movement for prom night. Because that yeah. to me is when sure. the high school kids are like, oh, I'm. G- this is the night. Nope, chaperone. So we call them this left and right. Nope, yeah. shut it down, shut it down. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's the thing. It's like in all the other scenes where we see the quote unquote teenagers who are what, mm-hmm. 25 to 30 years old. Least, yeah. yeah. But we're still telling a story about teenagers and hormones. So yeah. sex is going to be a part of that. Which Absolutely. I get, but also I'm yeah. kind of like, like the way that the movement told that story didn't match up with like actual high school experiences no, yeah. in my mind there's no. also like a she's all that dance battle at the prom <laughs> yeah, i forgot about that why oh, oh. they're like whipping their hair and singing and it's oh. like girls versus guys dance yeah. battle go so awesome i Very... love a dance battle <laughs> i don't mind a dance battle i'm just like okay did, did we all learn this in gym class yeah <laughs> Um, okay, so here are the things I wrote. The yes. pyramid. The, at the end of the opening number, yeah. right? That was kind of cool. I That's kind of cool. thought it was hilarious. Like, show yeah. I know. For the only time in the show. Let's get some levels. Like the showers. Like we got the showers. Like oh, doing yeah. The, the car dance. Yep, the car dance. Oh, yeah. Let us okay, not forget, sure. don't waste the moon. Totally, totally. Don't waste <laughs> the moon. Yep. There was like a moment where someone bench pressed someone while they were on top of a car. And then yep. I was like, what's the convention here? Like, can we move freely between vehicles? Like, like, are we, I don't know. I was just very confused about the levels. And then I was like, oh, good, a reprise so we can get that set piece off yep. stage. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Chris had a sword at one point. Oh, we, we had a sword. Right. Yep. In the middle of a out for blood slash Cracker Jack, uh, Chris had a sword. All of us. <laughs> for the, for the sacrifice. <laughs> yep. All of- oh, I was going to shout out the actual prom destruction. The 2012 revival is not perfect, but it does this a lot better. As far as the dumping of the blood goes, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they do a special on the bucket in the ceiling. Oh, sure. Do a special on Carrie and do a light, like a red wash while the bucket dumps nothing. And then Carrie does a super quick change of some kind to have a dress with blood on it now. Mm -hmm. And that represents it way better. And then we get to the destruction and all her telekinesis is she's using telekinesis to make people do things like she makes one guy snap his own neck or something and it's horrific oh it's awesome wow and it's all done through good choreo uh and it's so much better it's frightening and upsetting but compare that to this version where there's lots of strobes there's lots of pyro it's definitely they they yes. threw tech at it left and right they did but Man, it's uninteresting. Mm-hmm. Something the 2012 version also does better is yeah. that that moment immediately following the blood dump, it needs to be a lot more internal. Like, with like, because like, yeah, it's the focus turns inward on Carrie as she snaps. Yes. yes. As she finally snaps. Yeah. Yeah. In this version, it's like blood dump, weird play, game of keep away with everyone kind of pushing her and shoving her. Yeah. And then all of a sudden she was like, I am God. You will yeah. feel my wrath. <laughs> pyro, 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 strobe, 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 scrim. Lasers. Yeah. Lasers. Laser Absolute show. Thoughts yeah. of lasers. First of all, that's just not a great way of demonstrating this psychotic break that nope. this yeah. character's experiencing. Uh-huh. Yeah. But also the destruction itself is very hard to follow. It is. Yeah. It's impossible to tell what's actually happening. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like in the world of the play, what is actually going on. Yeah. I agree. It's a really interesting idea because, of course, you want to portray this safely. And there's so yes. much happening um, when you're doing a show live. Like, obviously, you could fly things. You could actually make telekinesis happen. Mm-hmm. But it's an enormous task to have, make sure that happens safely every night. And, of course, that's everyone's number one priority. I, I sympathize with the mountain that is to climb there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that this, the Broadway version, takes the worst possible safe method. Sure. And yeah. the 2012 revival takes the best possible safe method. Gotcha. And see, I disagree. Okay, go. First of all, the important thing that happens in the book yeah. is that it's almost an accident that Carrie destroys the yeah. gym. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, actually yeah, yeah. in the original movie, mm-hmm. yes. it seemed that way too. Totally. And, and that's an important difference. Whereas yeah. this is a very conscious, I'm going to kill everybody mm-hmm. kind of moment. In the book and in the movie, that's not the case. It was panicky in the in the movie in it, a way. Panicky and like 
it's it's more of a Rube Goldberg effect in the book. It's mm. Carrie closes the doors and somehow um, starts a fire. A, an electrical right. fire is, yeah. is started. That's right. And just everyone can't get out. And everyone can't get out because she sealed the doors. So that's really her only conscious moment in the beginning of malice. Yeah. Yeah. But like she doesn't flip a switch and go, "Cool, I'm gonna kill everybody." Yeah. yeah. But whereas in this, that's what happens. Yes. Yeah. I think the 1988 version is a victim of its time, whereas like nowadays with projections, we mm-hmm. probably could have figured out a better way to like light the gym on fire. Absolutely. Great call. This is the production that should have had an illusionist. You know, absolutely. Totally. Calling back to an episode that you heard a couple weeks ago, but we just recorded a couple days ago of um, Ghost, Ghost the Musical, yeah. which had an illusionist. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like this is the show that would have really helped to absolutely. do with the telekinesis, totally. and also just figuring out a more creative way to show the destruction of a town. Yeah, I, I think that's a great call. So, yeah. I think yeah. so. I think let's um, <laughs> let's give them a rating. Okay, so out of ten playbills, how many monkeys are we giving this direction and choreography? Crumbs, you can go first. What do you meow. think there, Producer Crumbs? Meow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. I don't I don't agree, but I respect it. Oh yeah, God. fine. Okay. Oh wow. I would have I would have gone with meow. Yeah. But <laughs> do you have more to say? Do you no? have more to say, no? baby? Crumbs oh. is Crumbs is, is nuzzling um producer Daft's mic right now. It's very, very cute. <laughs> um Oh crummy. Um, She's had the one thing to say. <laughs> Okay, well, I respect I respect your meow. Yeah. But I respectfully disagree, and I would say four monkeys. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and now she's leaving. Yes, she's sir. Like, yes. just... Well, if you don't want to talk, we don't want you on this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't want to actually engage in a discussion, like <laughs> so we're not just interested in opinions, four. we're interested in discussion. <laughs> yeah, four. Okay, four oh, out of so ten. <laughs> I say four. I think the direction and choreo is the biggest problem this sh- that this version of this show faces. Yeah, it hurts. And I'm sorry. Me, I'm but sorry. I, agree. I know. I know. I know. I know. Debbie Allen is a big. I know that hurts, but that's my take. It's okay. Yeah. It's not about her. Daff. I'm gonna go with a five. Great. Uh, like combining the direction and the choreo with, I think, more of a like my my rating's more heavily weighted towards the choreo side of things. I don't think the direction was awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, I found some stuff to love in the choreo, even if I even if I'm like, okay, why do we have the ensemble? What's yes. with the she's all at dance battle? Like, yes. it's very, it's technically very competent. Yeah. yeah, I'm just confused by it. I agree. Is, is this serving the story we're trying to tell? The answer is no, but. I still love it. So five. I'm a five. Mm. Five, um, But four, I just don't like the direction. Five. Yeah. I'm going to go to five as well so that we can potentially have a unanimous sound cue. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Are we going to talk about the design now? Finally. Finally. Scenic design by Ralph Koltai. Costume design by Alexander Reed. Lighting design by our director, Terry Hands. No, it's Whoa. not, is it? And sound design by Martin Levin. Mr. Hands. <laughs> it's what it said on IBDB, and I think he I think he helped with it. I think there was someone else who facilitated it, but I mm. think he des- did the design of it. Right, whether it was just like the, the head electrician actually programming it, or right. whether there was an actual other design presence who was like, all right, I guess this is yours now. I'd yeah. rather not be involved yeah. with this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's, so there we go. One way or another, I, that doesn't reflect something good. Anytime you've got a big enough production where the director is doing something other than directing, uh-huh. that's not a great sign. Yeah, <laughs> This it's is a production a that's headed mark. to Broadway, big old production. Directors should direct. Those are big enough departments that they need their own individual yes, people. Yes, yes, yep. <laughs> totally. Okay, so I think we should try to structure this a little bit more specifically because these elements all feel quite separate to me. Yeah, that's right. So so let's maybe start with the lighting. Right. So what does everyone think about it? Honest to God, after just shitting on Terry Hands and his lighting design, the lighting design is probably my favorite element of the design in this production. Daph? (laughs) I think it's the design that's like, like trying the hardest yes yeah yes <laughs> there, there's I actual agree. effort there so i'm like all I right agree. Yeah. yeah like i could at least see that you were trying to use lighting to tell the story i, yep. I agree how effective is it well we'll talk about that in a second yeah. but i at least see that someone showed up to do that job yes yeah. unlike the set design what is going on with the <laughs> set design in this you guys Okay, here's what I'll say. I love an intimate feeling show with yes. not a lot of stuff going Absolutely. on, but the problem is the stage is so big and they keep filling it with bodies. 
so that when there's no set, it really feels like there's no set and no one tries. Yeah. Absolutely. And also, prom committee, where are my decorations? I know. That what job was this? That doesn't cost that much money. Decorate it like no actual. You can decorate it like an actual prom. You know what I mean? It'll yes. Cost Twenty bucks at the dollar store. <laughs> yeah, in fact, if you do that, I will probably like it better than if a professional yes. set designer tries to design me a prom. Absolutely. And a set designer who probably like maybe didn't go to prom, like because if it's a British yeah. team. Maybe that's very true. There's not like a prom situation, just like in Canada, where we don't necessarily have proms, we have grads, which are ostensibly yeah. similar, but from what but I understand, a aren't, different. aren't quite the same as the no, true American prom. They're not, from what I understand yeah. about the American prom experience, it's like given a much heavier weight yes. than we do grad, that you wait your whole high school career to go to prom. Yeah, very interesting. Oh, crumbs is back. Oh, hello. Do you have more to say? You have something to say about the lighting design? She's like, I'm back for the technical aspect yeah, of the I have some podcast. Thoughts. That's, that's where um, I shine. I liked the staircase, though. I'll say that. I thought at the end, the starkness of it, yep. uh, although I couldn't see the blood against it, I feel like that would have been pretty um, nice in person. Yeah. I was just so confused by it. Yeah, like, it like was my weird. spatial awareness was so off because I was like, it looked like Carrie is dying, and there's her mom, and like she's about to go to heaven. Because I, I don't right. know where we are in space. True, I just That's have no true. idea where we are. Yeah, nothing at all. I cannot stress enough how empty the stage is. Other than that, like we have the gym set, which isn't really the set. It's just a painted, fly thing, painted backdrops. I don't and know. Backdrops. Um, we have Carrie's house, which is just like. A wall and a trap door. Mm -hmm. yep. And that's about it. And that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> that's the show. That's, and that's the cars. The so that's... What about the costumes, y'all? That's my least favorite part. So and I think staff agrees. The costumes? They're so terrible. Bad. They're so bad! <laughs> oh my god. I have never... S this is the worst part of this design. Yes. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, the gym outfits. So weird. It looks like they all went through a terrible disaster before they went to yeah. class. <laughs> like in the um, in the <laughs> opening number, you mean? Yes. One sleeve yeah. tied up, which again is very 80s, but I think there's something about it that yeah. isn't quite right. And the gym teacher's wearing a gi, like she's about <laughs> to go to karate. Oh, right. Yes, yes. Okay, and also, okay, this is my biggest pet peeve. In the book, I'm going to be yep. saying in the book a lot. Please, okay. audience at home, please take a shot every time Daphne says in the book. Right. Um, <laughs> in the novel, when Carrie makes her own dress, it is very specific yep. that this is this is the dress of someone who is very homeschooled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is. It, it has Juliet sleeves. And yep. if you don't know what that means, I want you to look up your yep. local production of a period piece set yep. in like the 1600s and you'll know what I'm talking you will about. Know. And it's like not ugly they're very clear it's, not a, it's ugly. nice but it's dated it's yeah. dated yeah. and it's not modern it is not a contemporary outfit yeah, yeah. it is carrie's version of a prom dress mm -hmm. yeah. and this is something both this show and the 2012 revival and the movie cannot commit to yes no. yeah. they still want to make carrie look cute and it's like no yeah i uh, i agree completely i also i know you guys like it i don't like carrie dancing with her prom dress i think that's bad and no good I don't know why this was bad and no good. I know that usually I would be like, ah, oh, they did. I think it's because that's somehow this moment of tongue and cheekness they got left in. That's fair. You know sure. what I mean? If, they, if that was okay. actually the production. Yeah, through great. and through. If you're going to be serious, be serious. Yeah. And I'm not going to like it, but maybe someone will. Yeah, but if she's going to dance with her prom dress. Then like, accept that this is yeah. kind of funny as well. True. Yeah. yeah, that's fair. I guess I interpret it in more of a sweet way. It is sweet. I can't deny that. Yeah. It like, just oh, didn't man. work for me on what she we is, were doing. She is so lonely. She's so yeah. lonely. Yeah. <laughs> Aww. That's sad. That's sad. Carrie, what, the story makes me sad. I don't yeah, like it. yeah <laughs> totally. Yeah, I agree. And also we're just going to call back to the cat suits and do me a favor. Oh, what, God. What was going on with I'm that sure. weird I dream of genie? No. Nope. Cats, why are they both wearing cat suits. Why I is can't. everyone wearing a cat suit all so of a many sudden? Cats. I don't understand it. I just don't understand. Also, okay, here's here's the last thing I'll say about the set design. Yes. We needed way more Jesus. Mm hmm The whole thing is she's crazy religious. She's crazy very religious. Crazy religious. And like there should have been crosses and religious iconography mm -hmm. all over the place. Well, yep. This should have been the most, like this should have been wall to wall Jesus and lambs and crucifixes. Totally. It doesn't cost you much because they, they did have a little like Carrie's house set piece that rolled they on, did. right? They did. Yeah. They and that should have been chair well. covered exactly. with Exactly. This is what I'm saying. That's easy to do. That's yeah. someone doing the set dressing or the uh, props yeah. design yeah. missed the mark. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
Oh, God. Okay. Out of 10 playbills, <laughs> how many it? monkeys? All yeah, written one? put it all together. You made me put it all together for yeah. a direction, I choreo. That's so. Yep, yep. I'll, I'll accept that. Design. Three. It's the worst thing about this show. <laughs> and this show's not good. Um, in my opinion, that's the biggest failing of this show is this enormous void of an empty stage. Okay. It makes it seem like we're still in the rehearsal hall. And it's so weird because this show, they talk about how much money it lost. Well, and how much was spent. How much was... Yeah. And I guess, was that all on the pyro and the lasers? I guess. They said the sound was a million dollars. Yep. Okay, and my interpretation of that quote, like, uh, Terry yeah. Hans was like, oh yeah, sound alone is like a million dollars, was less our specific production cost a a million dollars and more and more it just costs money to do sound on a broadway show oh wow relatively speaking to what i'm used to my sound budgets are normally much lower that's a good point because i'm not miking you know everyone that's such a good point yeah okay daff what do you think yeah i'm gonna have to go with a three three because like yeah the costumes are atrocious i think the lighting could have helped the destruction scene way more than it did there was no set yep Please, pr- please, producer comes. I'm speaking. <laughs> <laughs> so you're being very rude. Aww. None of the design elements helped this show at all. That's a great way to put it. None of them hurt. None of them helped it. And most of them hurt it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Compare and contrast Ghost, mm-hmm. where the design elements elevated yeah. some not as strong material. Right. Especially on a blank set. Yep. Absolutely. What's your take? Um, I'm a four. And I'm a four because I think I actually liked some of the starkness at times as a as a tool. Mm. Because yeah, it was very sure. clearly a sure. choice not to do yes. much stuff. It's gotta be, yeah. Uh, sometimes I thought that was actually a good choice. And then other times I thought it was a very bad choice. So I'm just gonna, yeah, I bump mine up just that little bit higher to a four. Okay, well, you know what? Let's talk about performances. <laughs> Um, okay, so we a little bit touched on uh, Barbara Cook. Because mm-hmm. it's going to be interesting because Barbara Cook never saw Broadway. Correct. And ostensibly, according to our mandate, we're covering the Broadway production. So I suppose we'll talk mostly about Barbara Cook mm-hmm. and maybe a little bit about Betty Buckley. Yeah, from the clips that we've seen. And thank you for your understanding that this is not a definitive ranking of what happened in the 1980s Broadway run, but more uh-huh. just musings on a theme. Okay, I really actually quite like Lindsay Haley. I think mm-hmm. what you said, Daff, about the vocal quality thing um, makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. But considering she was like 17 years old, oh, yeah. I'm like, whoa, girl. And obviously has had a really wonderful career since then. It makes me happy to look back on Carrie for her because it's like, wow, you did a really good job. And people noticed and I'm glad mm-hmm. because now you've had like a nice yep. long career in things that are maybe more appropriate for you. Yeah. My only note for her would be if you watch that press reel that mm-hmm. we um, that we watched, she does some weird things with her vowels, eh? Sure. Yeah. How much training would she have had though at that it's point? How much training right? has anyone had at seventeen, man? Like vowels right? are hard. Vowels are hard, and she, I'm not. You know, good and if, at them if the still. note is she goes a little, um, uh, a little open and a little, um, yes, not IPA. That's a beer. Um, <laughs> what's re- what's the British received? RP? RP. RP. She goes a little bit yeah. RP, thank you, with her pronun- with her um, singing pronunciation. Mm-hmm. That's not the end of the world, especially yeah. because this was, she was just MD'd and workshopped in um, London. Right. right. Yeah. 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 Totally. But it is a little weird to our contemporary sensibilities when yeah. you watch it. Yeah. Yeah. I like that they got a 17-year-old to mm-hmm. play the role of Carrie. Mm-hmm. I like that they got a bigger performer to play Carrie. Yeah. Because they don't do that in the in the revival or nope. in the movie. No. Nope. Like they're like, what is what is a homely, frumpy yeah. teenager look like? <laughs> Skinny and kind of conventionally attractive? Oh, Great. Good. Perfect for yeah. me. Yeah. 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 So I just I'm kind of glad that they finally did that. Yep, I agree. I think that's a I think that's a fine take. And we've already talked about where, how you felt about Barbara Cook a little bit. I wish we dialed up the unhinged mm-hmm. nature of Margaret yeah. White and just really went into the fact that this is a abusive mother figure yes. whose take on religion has just corroded her ability to see reason. You just see bits of Betty Buckley performing it though on oh. Broadway. She got the set jaw. Yes. And the, she just. She also like I, looks scary sometimes. Betty Buckley may have been, and based on the reviews as well, Betty Buckley was perfect in this track. Yeah. It was really incredible. I believe it. Yeah. Did you know that she also played the gym teacher in the movie? Yeah, she did. I did know that absolutely yeah. 
Did I you... think I recognized when I watched the movie, I actually recognized her as a familiar face yeah. like when I was young. And I was like, why do I know her? Um, okay, we need to say our uh, biggest compliments to the ensemble. This right? ensemble. I good mean, for them. Dear oh, Lord. Buy them all a drink. Yeah, or 10. I, I wonder if there will ever be an ensemble where we were like, this was a shit ensemble. It's rare. It's rare because they're the hardest working people in yeah. the biz. Even if I don't like how they were used, yes. I like this ensemble. 100%. Because they. when was the last time you saw a Broadway ensemble that did not go 300% all in? Yes. Oh, God. Like, I'm it's sure like, at I've the bar never... later, they all had a drink and they were like, what the fuck did we just do? Yeah. But, like, at the time, good for them. You wouldn't know it from the audience. I will celebrate this ensemble to eternity. They're amazing. What's your take, Def? I don't think that the script did the male characters any favors. No. no. Like, they're very, like, bro y and, like, yeah. Yeah. And it's just kind of awkward <laughs> to watch. Which is fine by me because we get enough men on Broadway. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, I'm not. Oh my God. Yep. I know that's not what you're saying. But yep. it's just very, but like, it's, it's true. The archetypical, yeah. like, high school bro. Yeah, which is unfortunate because, like, that's not really who these characters are supposed to be. That's true. Tommy yep. is supposed to be, like, more of a down to earth. There was a whole yep. segment that was cut from this version that was reinstated in the 2012 revival of Tommy's poem. Oh. Where yep. he, you learned, oh, Tommy has a softer side. That's and nice. It was really sweet. It's a and really nice song. Dear friend of the podcast, Nelson Bettencourt, sings it at Cabaret oh, sometimes. Yeah. It's very nice. Oh, that's cute. Yeah. I like that. In the 2012 revival, you kind of get to know more about Tommy mm-hmm. and you get to just kind of understand his take on this whole, you're taking someone who's not your girlfriend to the prom yeah. thing. Yeah. Oh, cool. And, and you don't really get you don't really know anything about him in this or True. who he is. And the same kind of goes for Billy, where he's just kind of there. Yeah. And we need more of like a kind of like a Lady Macbeth and, and Macbeth kind of vibe Ooh, to the two of yeah. them, where she's like, do it, do it. Yeah. I would shout out in general as well, um, Sally Ann Triplett as a Sue Snell. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just, oh my Sue gosh. Snell's a really interesting and I think deceptively challenging arc to, uh, yeah. um, to live through. Yeah. Um, someone who is very important to the action. You can never yeah. lose that character. Mm-hmm. But after her um, bit at the start, has virtually nothing to do in the show other than be shocked. True. And I think she does a really nice job and makes you kind of sad. Yeah. I know there's that end where Sue's watching all, all her friends die and it's like, Ugh. oh. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. yeah, which I think is the, the weakness of this version relative to the 2012 adaptation mm-hmm. where yeah, absolutely. like you get to see what it's like to be like the sole survivor yeah. of something that's horrifying. Oh, you are you were part of a graduating class of one. Yeah. And the one who has to relive it yeah. to, to help people understand explain, what happened. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So out of 10 playbills, how many monkeys are we giving these performances? I don't know, eight. I have no trouble with these guys. They work hard. Barbara Cook is miscast but works her ass off. And yeah. the legend is that Barbara Cook on opening night, potentially on the production that we saw that was filmed, was almost decapitated by that staircase at the end and promptly said, I'll see the the, uh, the three weeks left in this run through to the end, but then I'm done. She actually didn't say that. <laughs> what did she say? She said, I quit. Right. <laughs> you need to find a replacement. Right now. And then they said, okay, we'll find a replacement. But then they didn't find a replacement until after the four weeks. Right. So she had to do all of those shows. Yeah. Barbara Cook is literally one of the best oh, interpreters of um, Stephen Sondheim music oh, yeah. of our time. And our she's time. incredible. That's a good joke. Because Merrily? Oh. That's absolutely what I meant. Thank you. We are equally, <laughs> um, equally making that joke. <laughs> and thank you for noticing that. If everyone is in, ever anyone is listening, I made a very good Sondheim joke. Yeah, <laughs> it I was finished, obscure. I finished the hat. Oh, oh no! I went into the woods. A funny thing happened on the way to my forum. Okay, so anyway, oh, like you said eight, right? <laughs> I said eight. <laughs> oh, were we in the rating section? Oh my yeah. bad. <laughs> you said eight. Dab yeah. out of ten playbills, how many yeah, monkeys? I'm gonna go with an eight. Like nobody's like the faults I have with this show are not the performance. I agree. It's, it's, it's the words absolutely. we're making yeah. these people say. Yeah, yeah, I would actually say nine personally. Yep. Terrific. There's just a few things that kind of grind my gears. Absolutely. But is it Tony time? It's Tony okay. time. <laughs> Okay, friends, if you've been around for a little while, you know that we do a Tony Awards section. And in that section, normally we give you the fast facts about whatever Tony year that this show is eligible for. For season two to like, you know, switch it up a little bit, make a little game of it. So each uh, week, one of 
us will um, be kind of coming up with a few trivia questions that have to do with the Tony Awards for that season and other person or people in this case will guess what the answer is. And I am so excited because this week Paul is going to be making up the questions and Daphne and I will be answering. So we're talking about, we're pretty sure that Carrie here was uh, eligible for the 40, 43rd Tony Awards, mm-hmm. which took place on June 4th, 1989. Um, it's unclear based on our research exactly what eligibility, eligibility period they fell into, and they received no noms, so that doesn't help at all. So we're going to talk about the 43rd Tony Awards. Ooh. But for now, I'm going to try to help Jill guess the three musicals that were Jill and Daphne. I'm going to help Jill and Daphne (laughs) guess the three musicals that were nominated for Best Musical in the 43rd Tony Awards. Okay. Okay, they're hosted by Angela Lansbury. I knew it. Who just every year in the 80s. Yeah. So three musicals. One of them is a musical we've covered on this podcast. Yep. Oh, do you know? I can call that one. Okay. Hold it for a second. See if you can figure it out, Um, Jill. Oh, can can I give a hint? Give a hint. Yeah. (laughs) Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Great hint. Right. Yes. Great hint. Okay. Totally. What is it? We're the star mice. The mighty star mice. <laughs> You'll recall that from our uh, one of our favorite episodes with dear friend of the podcast Ryan Siegel. Yeah, and actually, it's a fantastic. That's one of my favorite shows we've covered. Also. Very nice. It's just so bonkers. It's oh. bonkers. This second show, I've never heard of it outside of Tony trivia. Oh, okay. Um, it doesn't exist outside of that. So I'm, I'm going to be broad with the hints. Sure. Okay. The title is Two Colors. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it's a bunch of music from the jazz age, but was, that doesn't yeah. help you at all. Um, um, you just got beat up. Yeah, it's black and blue. Black and blue yeah, yeah, is yeah, what yeah, it's yeah. called. Isn't there like a tap element to the show too? Yep. It's a musical review celebrating the black culture of dance and yeah. music in Paris between World War One and yes. World War Two. So a lot of music of um, Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Fats yeah. Waller. Yeah. The best musical winner for that year is also a dance show. It has the name of this famous choreographer in the title. Oh, sure. Okay. Do you know it? Yeah. One of the most famous choreographers of all time. Mm-hmm. Fosse? Nope. Good Good guess. Other most famous choreographer <laughs> of all time. Okay. Because um, I thought it was Fosse, so now I have to rethink. Oh, no. Oh, you didn't You didn't have it. No. It's not Fosse. No. Nope. Okay. Okay, hold on. Um, it's just a, it's a review show of a bunch of this choreographer's choreography. Yes. Yes, it is. Uh, and yes, the, I know what it the is. The title is, is Name this person's and the plate, the location where the, the location. show took place. Yeah, it is obscure yeah. and, and very weird. It's also worth noting at this time that I know significantly less <laughs> than yeah. is I was surprised you either t- of our coaches. I was surprised yeah. you decided to be on this side of the table rather than giving the hints. I just, I like playing games. <laughs> Directed and choreographed by this person? Yeah. That's wild. If As, staff doesn't know, we should no, just... I'm definitely not going to guess it. Um, so the show is Jerome, Jerome Robbins, Robbins Broadway. Broadway. Ah, there Jerome Robbins is the famous choreographer who um, directed and choreographed West Side Story, most famously, and mm-hmm. many, many others. The year before this was the Phantom Year. Yes. And there's so, it's this, this is a lull after a huge Tony year. Um, so it's a very weird a year. A few big Tony years, actually. Because like yeah. 87 was Les Mis, wasn't it? 86 or 87. Also workshop yeah. by the Royal Shakespeare Company. Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, you're right. totally right. How the mighty have fallen. Oh. <laughs> Shirley Valentine, The Heidi Chronicles, Lend Me a Tenor. Oh, that's First right. First saw its life yeah. at this point. Like in terms of the format for Broadway, not as many um, that followed that traditional style. Like people were Definitely not. pushing maybe the boundaries of what a Broadway show could be at that time. So that's pretty neat to think about. I think it says something about how hated Carrie was at the time. <laughs> that it didn't even, even those of us who didn't like the music could argue it has nice and well crafted enough music that it should get a nom in, yeah. a, in this in this season. It should. And maybe the problem is maybe it's actually eligible for last season. But if it was eligible for this season, it should have gotten a nom. I agree. Yeah. Like it's at least as good as Starmites. Love it to death. But Starmites does not have great music. Um, Starlight has delightful music, and I know Barry Keating follows us on social media. As Barry Keating, we love you. Hi, Please Barry. come on our podcast. Yeah. Oh, that would be fun. I Wouldn't should ask him. Would that be fun? Him. I would love that. Okay. So that was the Tonys. Weird Tony here. Carrie didn't perform. Okay, the big Q before the last yeah. big Q. Should this be a musical? Daph, what do you think? My answer is no, and for a pretty simple reason. There's this adage that we use in musical theater of when emotions read a certain height, you, you gotta just sing about it. And then when we reach a height beyond that, you gotta dance about it. Uh-huh. There's musical theater at its best yeah. um, as storytelling. But the problem with Carrie 
with that in mind is that something else happens when Carrie's emotions reach yeah. a certain point. <laughs> wow, good take. Yeah. And so one of those two things suffers. And in this case, it's the fact that you barely remember she's telekinetic. Totally. Which is the same thing with Matilda, which is just Carrie Jr. Less bloody Carrie. Yes, less bloody Carrie. (laughs) But it's the same thing. Like in Matilda, like we barely see her powers at all. And so I also just think that the medium of musicals is really hard to do with a character like Carrie, Mm -hmm. who's so much of the of the book of the novel is her inner monologue. Yes. Because she's just a very quiet character. But in this, she has to sing about her feelings. Mm -hmm. And that's just not who this character is as a person. That even her inner monologue just doesn't work with the medium of like soliloquies. Yeah. I love that take. Me too. Uh, No, I agree. I don't actually have much to add. I think that is excellent and accurate. And I don't think it should be a musical. I agree. And this is surprising because I love this musical. Me too. I hope to produce this musical someday, maybe someday when the Vic has more money and we can produce, um, when we can license shows, we can afford to license shows. This would be a great show to license. It gives a lot of opportunity to a lot of mm-hmm. young adults to um, really live some cool moments yes. and to um, to create something really fascinating together. That said, musical theater is at its best when it's elevating the relatively mundane. Mm-hmm. Um, when it's, one of my favorite musicals of all time is Sunday in the Park with George. Mm-hmm which is a meditation on the artistic process. Yeah. It elevates what could otherwise be a very boring story. Even the most famous musical of all time, the most famous good musical of all time, in my opinion, is Les Mis, Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. which still elevates a very long, meandering book where the climax of it is a small fight in the French Revolution. Not Mm -hmm. even the climax of the French Revolution, a small conflict. Mm -hmm. And it elevates that to epic status. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is already epic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is epic without the music. Yeah. The music doesn't add anything. Even if it is good. Should this be a musical? No. That said, it is. So I'm going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. I would love to yeah. also do it. Okay. So is it a flop? Is it a bop? Or do we need to make it stop? Daff. I think we all might be a little different here. We're all, I think we might have the first three way everyone does goes different. I'm, I'm going to go with a, with a flop. You say flop. You don't say okay. make it stop. I don't think it's irredeemable. Okay. okay. Like, Paul, I know you mentioned that you think a lot of the problems of the show were fixed in the 2012 revival. That's my revival. opinion. Correct. I, I disagree. Totally. I think the wrong things were changed. Uh, <laughs> very interesting. Or I think that we didn't fix everything that we could have fixed. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think it's irredeem- irredeemable, but I think it's it's like you said, it's the fact that this musical needs to rise to the epic subject mm-hmm. matter it's been given. Yeah. And it doesn't do that. I think yeah. it could. I just don't think it does. Very right. interesting. Yeah. What about you, Jill? I think it's a bop. But I think I agree in that not through and through. Yep. Like, there are things about it that I love a lot and a lot of things that need to yep. change. So I'm saying bop conditionally. Mm. <laughs> and I also say this is actually a bop. What a weird situation. It shouldn't be a musical, but because it is, it's actually a bop in my yeah, eyes. Yeah, I know. Um, this is so what tricky. What a fascinating case study. I'm a sucker for telling stories in a wide variety of ways and for modern mythology. Mm-hmm. I, there's nothing I love more than a modern mythology. Yeah. All we're doing is telling stories. So just like freaking Beowulf or something has become yeah, a myth now, yeah, yeah, yeah. the stories that we are telling these days also become myths, even though the medium we tell them with is different. Carrie is a myth at this point, so I'm very excited to see different takes on the myth and to see it evolve. Interesting. But we don't yeah, we don't yeah. owe anything to the original author of stories. Stories become something greater than that. Mm-hmm. That said, this adaptation doesn't necessarily tell that myth in the most effective way. Mm-hmm. But I think there's enough beauty here for me to classify it as a secret bop and to um, want to tell this story in some capacity. Speaking of authors, too... Stephen King liked the show. Know. Yeah. He liked it. He also, and that's th- good. That's this good is thing. also during the time in his career when he was doing literal truckloads of coke. So much coke. <laughs> so much coke. Entire so novels were written it. while yeah, high was, off his ass. Yeah. I, I feel like it was really fun to be on coke in New York in the 80s. So I think he was just I having mean, a really nice time. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Did we do it? We did it. Yay. That's Carrie the Musical. Please join us in a couple weeks' time where we're going to talk about anyone can whistle, y'all. Stephen Sondheim's 
biggest flop that made it to Broadway? No, second biggest. Was Merrily bigger? Merrily was Merrily like, was a bigger flop. Well, just, yeah. Right. This okay. is maybe the second. I'm so I excited guess? to talk about it. I don't know anything about, at this point, I don't know anything about Anyone Can Whistle other than the song. Yeah. Which is a beautiful song. I can't wait. Join us then. Happy Halloween. Ooh. Hi, everyone. This is producer Daphne speaking. Thank you all so much for listening to Monkeys and Playbills, the show where we take a look at Broadway musicals that had 100 performances or fewer before closing. To learn more about the show, you can follow us on Instagram at Monkeys and Playbills Pod, on Twitter at Monkey Playbills, or email us at monkeysandplaybillspod at gmail.com. You can also support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash monkeysandplaybills. Monkeys and Playbills is proud to be a Village Conservatory for Music Theatre podcast. Original music for the show is provided by Paul DeGers, and the show is produced and edited by Daphne Finlayson. Thank you all so much for listening, and join us next week where we take on Anyone Can Whistle.